if we get to a point where um, it's becoming too unruly to keep up the current lectures, there will always be a past lecture up there covering the material from a particular chapter. So you can still see the lectures there. Again, if you're here in the live class, um, I don't see any reason for you to watch the entire lecture. It's there for an exception basis. Okay, so if there's a particular slide, then maybe you're like, huh, what? What did we say? Fat? What is FASB? You can go back and you can look at that portion of the lecture for whatever area you have a question about. Okay, that's the point of recording these, not to have you go back. Sometimes I have students that go back and they watch the whole thing over again. They're like, geez, I'm never getting the homework because all I'm doing is watching your lectures. Well, don't do that. Don't watch the whole lecture. Just watch the parts that are. Uh, relevant to questions that you may have okay all right good so we are going to go ahead and uh, review a little bit of some of the things that we said uh, last week from chapter one and then uh, continue on where we left off and uh, with some luck maybe get through the chapter one quiz if um, you were looking at the chapter one quiz and there's some things like huh what I don't understand this question uh, don't worry about that right now because you're really not prepared to answer those questions yet because we haven't really gone through the process of learning the information that would allow you to answer uh, those quiz questions. And then we do the quiz together, right, in class. And potentially uh, we'll be able to knock that out today for Chapter 1. Uh, if you want to, you can pull that table. I'm not sure why we came all the way over here not to get the table. So what you can do is pull that table out. Pull this table out a little bit, so you want to probably move back some. Ma'am, in the red, you want to move back? Excuse me? Hello? Move back some so they can move this table. This would all have been a lot easier if you could just move back a little bit. better view of the screen and then you can sit on that side you can sit on that side and you both get a table okay so as we mentioned last time okay we have what we have a set of financial statements that we're going to be studying in this class the primary ones that we're going to spend time with up front here in the very beginning of the class are going to be the balance sheet the income statement those um, are the main ones that we'll look at. We'll also look at something called the Statement of Retained Earnings, which is basically um, akin to the Statement of Stockholders' Equity. Towards the end of the class, we'll talk about a uh, Statement of Cash Flows, and that will come towards the end of the class. Now, when we prepare these financial statements, we follow generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP. Everybody follows the same rules when they prepare their financial statements. Why do we why do we do that? We talked about last time. Why do we have a set of rules that everyone has to follow when they prepare their financial statements? So that we can compare company A to company B. We know that they all follow the same standards. We know that they just weren't sort of playing jazz with it, right? Doing whatever they want. They follow some rules and we can use that to make investment credit decisions. Our what, primary users of our financial statements, which in this class we're focusing on external users, are what investors and creditors, right? Okay. Now, who writes these standards? Who issues these standards that we're supposed to follow? Good. We have the Financial Accounting Standards Board, private, not-for-profit organization that sets the standards, the FASB. Who's overlooking the FASB? Good. The SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, a federal agency created by the 3334 Securities Acts, are the entities. Guys, you're not going to be able to stand. I can't have you standing there like that. I don't want the Mount Rushmore standing, you know, in the back of my class. So you're going to have to somehow find a chair. Okay, there's got to be a chair out there somewhere that you can 
that you can sit. I can't have guys standing there with their hands in their pockets the whole class. Okay. Okay, so you got the Security Exchange Commission. They are the federal agency. I mean, I, what, what are they going to do? Stand there like this? You know, and watch the class and get something out of it? I don't think so. Okay, they're going to have to do something. Okay, to sit down or something. Okay, Security Exchange Commission is the entity that does what? That oversees the FASB. When they created the SEC, remember, they said, hey, look, the profession should be in position to be able to determine what the standards are, right? So even though SEC has the legal authority to set the accounting standards, they have delegated that to the FASB, right? Financial Accounting Standards Board. They promulgate generally accepted accounting principles, and then GAAP is what we use to prepare the financial statements that we'll be looking at in this class. Now, when I say we'll be looking at them, we'll really be doing more than looking at them. We will be learning how to prepare them, right? We'll be looking at the building blocks to actually allow us to prepare these statements. Is this changing on its own? I don't want to play narrations. Okay, and I always have to forget. My clicker in every class. Okay, now um, we talked a little bit about ethics and stuff. I'm not going to uh, repeat that discussion. We got through that, okay. All right, so let's just go ahead and let's start to take a look at some of the very basic principles, okay, that are involved in the preparation of financial statements, okay. And so we have measurement principles. Okay, measurement principles that we use that we use, the two main ones that we use are historical cost and fair value. Okay. Historical cost says that you report an item on your financial statements at its original cost to you. Okay. So let's say I bought a piece of land and I bought that land in 1974. And I bought that land in San Francisco. We'll say, I don't know. 8,000 square foot lot or something. Maybe when I bought that lot, it was what? It was, cost me 100,000, right? Today, that same lot may be worth 1.1 million, but I would still report it on my financial statements as land at 100,000 because that's what I paid for it back in 1974, or whatever it was, right? So for things like land, buildings, we use historical costs to report those on their financial statements, okay? Now they do this because what? Everybody looks at their piece of land, at their building and says, oh, this piece of land, you know, it's, could, you could put a store on here, so it's worth $5 million. Somebody else looks at that piece of land and says, I wouldn't give you 50000 for that. That's a horrible piece of land. So because a fixed asset like land, building, equipment, the value is so subjective, FASB has come in and said, hey, remember the stock market crash because people were putting whatever they want in the financial statements? Well, now, if you have a fixed asset like land building, since that's very subjective as to the value, we will carry that at historical cost. Okay? Now, we also have up here the fair value principle. Now, with fair value principle, we say you can carry certain items on your financial statements at whatever the fair market value is at any point in time. Now, that means that the entire world will have to agree as to the value at that item at the date of your balance sheet. Say you're preparing your balance sheet of December 31st. The whole world will have to agree. This is the value of this item. Can you think of something that you might invest in, hint, hint, in which everybody agrees is the market value at the end of the day? Gold is a good example. Bitcoin, stock, 
right? What happened? Let's talk about stock. Company invests in stock, right? They buy a stock investment. They're going to report that in the financial statements. They ring a bell at whatever, 4 o'clock Eastern, and everybody says, that's the price of Apple stock. That's the price of gold, whatever, right? And so in that case, they would allow you to carry that particular item at fair value because there is no subjectivity. People aren't making it up. Everyone's agreed. That's the price that you have to pay for Apple stock. Okay, so depending on what item we're talking about, if it's something like land, building, a fixed asset, we use what? Historical costs. If we're talking about something like a stock or gold or something where the world has agreed as to the value, then we can use what? Fair value. Okay. Okay, good. Question? Yes, sir. I would still say land. Are all county tax assessors connected to each other? No. no, no Would you um, sell, you said you were in real estate last time, would you sell a piece of property for what the county tax assessor, uh, uh, would you access it? I could if, it, if the market was undervalued at the time. Okay, so if I sit there and uh, I look at a piece of property and the county tax assessor says it was worth a million dollars and the market is saying it's worth 800000 would I still pay a million for it? No. Okay. If the county tax assessor says it's worth um, 800000 and you have 10 people bidding to buy that thing for a million dollars, would you value it at 800000 Okay, so county tax assessor is not an objective measure of the value of that. It's about what? The interaction between the individuals and the market, right? But we don't know how that is going to play out until the transaction takes place, right? Okay, so for that reason, to remove that subjectivity, FASB says historical cost until an actual transaction takes place. Now, the person who buys it, that pays a million, that now becomes their historical cost, and the company that sold it, they're going to do what? They're going to remove it from their books because they sold it, and they can show a nice gain of 900000 or whatever, if it was a million, and they bought it for 100000 of 900000 whatever, and the new people will show it at a million. Okay. Now, FASB has done this because what? you're probably sensing a little bit the subjectivity that comes in. I mean, you're, you're not only sensing it, you've experienced it directly, the subjectivity that comes in. And you know that. You know, someone walks, when I put my house up for sale, the real estate guy came in and said, oh, you can only ask 900000 for this house because that's what the house is down the street sold for. I said, for 900000 they can stand at the curb and look at it. I'm not <laughs> selling it for 900000 So if you can't get it for what I wanted, was I wanted like 1.16, then I'm not selling it. Period. End of story. Somebody bought it for 1.16, so what did he know, right, based on – and it was assessed much lower than that. Okay, so – Okay, so they say to remove, now going back to the accounting standards, to remove all that subjectivity, all that up and down that can happen, all that interaction with the market, they say mm -mm. It's things like land, buildings, historical costs. Things like a stock, you cannot buy Apple stock for less than what it was quoted at the end of the day. Anyone who sells it to you for less than that is a fool, and anyone who sells it to you for more than that is taking you. Okay, because you say, well, maybe tomorrow it'll go up or down. I mean, there are things like futures and stuff in that, but okay, but basically, we just go with that quoted market price, and we're comfortable with that for things like stock. Okay, okay, good. Now you come over monetary unit assumption. When we put information in our financial reports, okay, it's dollars and cents. We don't say we have a very, very, very nice piece of land that we think you could build something on. So even though we're carrying it at 100,000, it's a very, very nice piece of land that we think is actually worth 10 million. And we put that somewhere? No. We put land, we put what? 100,000. Monetary unit assumption. We're using dollars and cents. Economic entity assumption. That says that we do not commingle the financial information of the owners with the financial information of the business. 
Remember we said that a corporation is a separate legal entity? So let's say I set up a corporation, whatever. It doesn't have to be a corporation. Let's say it's a sole proprietorship, even though I would be having that limit, that uh, exposure to unlimited liability, right? Let's say it's a sole proprietorship. It's a barber shop, right? And in my barber shop, I have three barber chairs, okay? But at home, I have an old-fashioned barber chair that was, you know, in Hayward in 1900 when they first started, 1876 when they first started Hayward. This was the original barber shop chair in Hayward. I keep that at home. And I invite my friends over and we have parties and I have them lay in the barber chair and I pour shots down their throat. Okay? Now. Those three barbershop chairs are going to be on the financial reports of my barbershop business. How about the one that's my own personal asset at my house? I will not include that on the financial reports of the business because I'm not using it in the business, right? Okay. Now, let's say one day I have what alcoholics call a moment of clarity. And I say, you know, this is a little bit silly for me to have this chair over here to waste time, you know, giving my friends shots. I'm going to take this chair, I'm going to put it in my barber shop, and instead of charging, what do they charge for a haircut? I have no idea. Okay. Instead of what? Charging $30 a haircut, I'm going to charge $50 a haircut, and you get to sit in the antique chair. Now that barber chair, that one, that antique one is going to be what? Included in the financial reports of the company because I brought that into my business use, haven't I? Yeah. Okay. So you keep the what? The financial information of the owners separate from that of the business. Yes, sir. Would you keep it at the cost that you bought it at previously or would you reassess the value of it? Um, I would bring it in. And that's a great question. I would bring it in at the fair value at the date that I brought it in. So whatever the fair value was at the date that I brought it in, that's what I bring it in. Okay, and that would be the same for land, by the way. If I have a private piece of land, but I bring that into the company, whatever I brought it in at that date is what it's worth. So I said I bought it back in 74. The business acquired it back in 74. If I have that same piece of land and it's not in the business, and then I bring it into the business, and it's worth a million dollars at the date I bring it in, even though I personally paid 100000 for it, I bring it in at a million. And I would probably take stock back worth a million dollars back for my contribution to the business. I'm not sure who's next. Okay. Go ahead. We'll get to you. Well, how does this differ from your um, previous example with uh, you know, buying land uh, for personal uses and how you can't, um, like a real estate agent wouldn't always be giving the correct um, amounts. Like you could always sell it for more. So when it comes to land being transferred to a business, how does it differ um, if you're taking the market value? Uh, I would probably have to get some sort of appraisal, okay, to be appropriate in what I'm bringing it in at. But because it's a new transaction at that point in time, then they're saying, okay, bring it in at whatever the value is at that point in time. Because in a, in a sense, remember I said the new person who acquired it? Well, in a sense, a new person is acquiring it, a new business is acquiring, a, a new entity is acquiring it, the business is acquiring it at that point in time. And if it's not something in which there's the arm's length type transaction, then I probably would have to get it appraised or something to do that. But they don't accept that because what would happen? Every accounting period, every company in the world would be doing what? We need to reappraise all of our land and see what the value is of all of our land. That sound you hear is the objectivity idea collapsing, right? And companies would constantly be doing that. Now, if this bothers you that we carry the land at a historical cost, then I would invite you to uh, look at the international financial reporting standards. IFRS says that it is okay to revalue the land, the uh, uh, fixed assets like land and building. We revalue them every accounting period, and we write them up and down accordingly. So there is argument for what you're proposing, but FASB has looked at all that and said, no, we're not having all that up and down, and everybody's going to get an appraiser, and the appraiser is going to say whatever it is that they want the appraiser to say, we're not doing that. Okay, so for things like the historical, uh, for fixed assets, buildings, land, it's historical cost.
okay but if there's a transaction where I took a piece of land and I brought it into the business they're saying well this marks the date that the business acquired it that becomes a historical cost but then it stays at that historical cost yes sir uh, if somebody gives you an asset like they don't you don't pay for it and they just give it to you do you mark it in your accounting report as being uh, as, as being like the uh, value that it's appraised for or do you just uh, would you not include it? Uh, I would bring it in at the fair market value at that date whatever the fair market value was determined to be at that date and if they just gave it to me, I'd have to call out some sort of contributed capital. I mean, that's kind of uh, a little bizarre for a for-profit entity. Uh, but if something like that happened, I'd have to report some sort of contributed capital like that. Okay, for for not-for-profits, that kind of stuff happens. Mm-hmm. No, I bring it in at whatever I determined the fair value was of the date I brought it in. So what we're doing is we're marking the day that it came into the business. So if the business acquired it back in 74, then I use the 74 price. If I bought it in 74, but I bring it into the business in 2019, we use the 2019 value. So with the example of real estate, that's an appreciating asset. So the historical value is, is in that example, lower at 100K or whatever you said. Mm -hmm. value. Yeah. But as investors or as the market, if we're looking at companies who have depreciating assets like equipment, for example, and we look at their financial reports, are their reports, their valuations inflated because that equipment's not worth what it once was like 20 years ago? It's not inflated because... And we're jumping a little ahead, but that's okay. Um, what, the way we would report that, let's say it was equipment that we paid 100000 for, we would show that we paid 100000 for it. And just quickly, let's say that equipment, we paid 100000 but it has a 10-year life. So that means that that equipment is depreciating at what, um, 10000 a year? And so let's say I've held that equipment for nine years. Well, that means that there's a depreciation that's accumulated over the last nine years of $90,000, right? So I would literally, right next to the account equipment on my financial statement, on my balance sheet, I would report out accumulated depreciation, and I would show $90,000 of accumulated depreciation, and so what we call the net there's different terms for it, but I'm just going to call it net carrying value of that equipment would be uh, $10,000, meaning this thing's got one year left, right? So if you're thinking of buying the stock of this company and you're hoping that this company could pay you some sort of dividend pretty soon, is this your company? That's not your company because they got a cough up of $100,000 coming pretty soon, don't they, to replace that piece of equipment? Conversely, if they had just bought the equipment and what, only taken, you know, let's just say to make it the extreme other way, one year of depreciation, now what? Now the carrying value is 90000 You're looking and saying, hey, they've got a lot of value left in that equipment, so maybe this is your company, right? Just really depends on your um, investment objectives. You may look at that uh, depreciation of 90000 and you may sit there and say, I don't care because look at how productively over the last 10 years this company has used their equipment. They've had this growing income year over year over year by using equipment. I don't care that they are getting ready to cough up 100000 because I'm a young guy and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to invest in this now and I'm going to continue the ride up with them and I'm you're in effect giving them your money so they can invest in more equipment like this and continue to make more money more money right so how that's viewed will depend on the objectives of the investors as well that's why I said if you're looking for a dividend if you're old like me I don't like this because now I gotta wait 10 more years maybe I, I, I'm not that old 
hopefully I have 10 years left. Okay, nobody knows for sure, but, you know, okay. But I'm thinking, you know, hey, I don't want to wait around 10 years. I want to enjoy that money. Okay, I'm going to buy depend undergarments with that money when they finally start paying me a dividend. Okay, I'm looking for a company where I can buy beer now. Okay, all right, whatever. Okay, all right. You come over. Any other questions? Good questions, guys. Anything else? Okay, good. So we come over and we take a look at a set of financial reports. Okay? And when we look at the financial reports, we have our revenue. Revenue is the money that you made. It's what you earned. Your revenue. Okay? By the way, oh, I'll talk about it later. Revenue. Okay? Then we have expenses. Expenses are what? Costs that you incurred in the generation of revenue. Revenue minus expenses equals net income. Okay, now we come down and we talk about now our retained earnings. So net income is like our earnings. And then what's this? Tell me when you know what this is. And you're saying that you say, I have no idea until I do what? Isn't that little squiggly line is amazing, right? Okay, you put that squiggly line in there, everybody goes, oh, it's a pig, it's a pig, I got it. Before then, I don't know what it was. Okay, now, question. What did the pig say when the farmer grabbed him by the tail? Well, yes, but translated into English, the pig said, this is the end of me. Okay, now, don't worry. This is the time when you roll back to the video, you watch it two or three times, and you go, oh, I get it. Okay, haha, ha, that's funny. Okay, or I might hit you on the way home. Okay, now what happens? Where do you put your income? You put your income in your piggy bank, don't you? Now, if this business just started, I didn't have any income before, and I'm putting this year's income into my piggy bank, right? Okay? We call that piggy bank retained earnings. Okay? Now, what happens? Every now and then, you reach into your piggy bank, and you go buy some ice cream, don't you? You take some money out of the piggy bank. You go buy a hamburger, pizza, whatever. You take some money out of your piggy bank. Okay, when you take money out of the piggy bank, and guys, don't be offended. I have to put the plug somewhere where we pull the money out, and I'm going to put it back there at the back of the piggy bank. We pull the little plug out, and we take some money out of the piggy bank. That money that we take out of the piggy bank is called a dividend. It's called a dividend. Now, we call it a dividend because what? If we have several stockholders, when we pay them out some of our income, we divide it amongst them, don't we? So we call it a dividend. Okay, but every now and then, you pull some money out of the piggy bank. That's called a dividend. And then the money that is left in the piggy bank is the, and we basically did a month. You could do show a year's worth of activity here. This is what's left in the piggy bank at the end of the accounting period, right? So we started our business on September 1st. During September, we had income of 2750 We took what was left, right? You make your paycheck, but you got to pay gas and stuff to get to work, don't you? You're left with some money left over, right? That money that's left over is your income. You take your income and you put it where? You put it in your retained earnings. You put it in your piggy bank, don't you? But every now and then, John, the human being, needs to go have dinner or something, don't I? So what do I do? I pull some money out of my corporate account so I can go and what? John can have dinner, right? And then what's left is whatever I have left in the corporation. That's called my retained earnings. If you pull your earnings out, have you retained them? If you pull your earnings out, have you retained them? You have not. Okay. Okay, good. Now, the next statement, we said we talk about the income statement. I know the slide said stockers, statement of stockholders' equity, but I said we're going to be calling statement of retained earnings right now. Then we have our statement of retained earnings, and then we prepare a balance sheet. Okay? Now, they call it a balance sheet because it balances. 
they call it a balance sheet because it balances because assets will equal my liabilities plus my stockholders equity they call it a balance sheet because it balances assets will equal liabilities plus stockholders equity this balance sheet will balance what does it mean if the balance sheet doesn't balance it means we did something wrong and it means that we will beat this balance sheet until it balances nobody goes home until it balances it means we did something wrong we'd have to figure out what we did wrong so the balance sheet must balance right that's why they call it a balance sheet okay income statement revenue minus expenses sometimes I have students get confused they say I don't know what's on the income statement well revenue minus expenses is net income revenue minus expenses is net income what do you report on your income statement net income I take my net income and I put it where in my retained earnings my piggy bank every now and then I pull some money out if I pull money out I haven't retained it right so I subtract it from whatever I put in and then I have a balance sheet and they call it a balance sheet because what it balances yes sir that's the money I pulled out of the piggy bank guys we are not going to have two or three classes going on at once everything's up here go ahead it's again sir when your colleague asks a question respectfully listen to his question understand his question contemplate the answer etc someone asks something even if you know the answer listen to the discussion okay say again okay. uh, it's 1300 yeah. that's a dividend that's the money I pulled out of the piggy bank so if I put 2750 into a piggy bank and then I pull 1300 out of a piggy bank I'm left with 1450 right 1300 is the money I pulled out of the piggy bank every now and then the owners want to pull some money out of their business don't they and so we reflect that by calling that a dividend and show it as a less see how it says less less means I have subtracted it from what was in the piggy bank to compute what's left in the piggy bank yes sir does a dividend have to go to a specific place or can it just be for any reason dividends are at the decision of the board of directors if it's a corporation and they do not have to pay a dividend but periodically every now and then I don't know about periodically but every now and then they will decide to pay a dividend to their shareholders and when they do then it goes to the shareholders and the shareholders can put it in their private bank account they can go have a party they can go anything within the confines of the law let's say that okay <laughs> okay all right good now you come over and I don't care about this question a business organized as a separate legal entity under state laws called what is a corporation corporations are formed under state law even though their finance reporting is regulated by the federal government the SEC and we said that the federal government can do that because of what how does the federal government get involved in dictating to state formed entities what sort of accounting they have to use how can the federal government tell a state chartered entity a corporation is a state chartered entity how can supreme court is does not set laws so the supreme court would look at a law and say it's okay or it's not okay so Congress and the president set laws right okay and so it is a law that companies corp uh, pri uh, corporations okay public companies have to follow the standards that are issued by the FASB but SEC is saying follow FASB right SEC has delegated their authority how can the federal government butt into a state chartered entity and tell them what they have to do Ricky Henderson What's your answer? Uh, 
Oh, it's arrested for what? Well, oh, I was oh, saying because you got a Ricky Henderson. Yeah, no, no, no. You know what base he's stealing in that picture, right? Yeah. Okay. But um, I was going to say, I don't know if this is right at all, but I mean, I'm assuming because when they do their taxes, I mean, they have to have an asset report anyway. Or like they have to, like, I don't know, like I said. Yeah. It doesn't really have any, much to do with taxes. I, I would assume because state law can't supersede federal law. Well, you're on the right track. We have something called interstate commerce. Can you buy a stock of a company that is incorporated in Delaware? Yes. Yes. Well, that means there's a California citizen who's buying stock that was what? A company that was incorporated in Delaware. And so that's where the federal government gets to come in and say, guess what? We're going to regulate that. Just like what? Transportation laws. There's a federal department of transportation because you drive your unsafe truck carrying hazardous waste out of California and into, well, probably not out of California, probably into California. California says, wait a minute, Department of Transportation has to have some jurisdiction over that. So is this under the laws of the Federal Trade Commission? No, it's under the Security Exchange Commission. Oh, okay. Okay, law 1933-34 Securities Act creates the SEC, but the federal government can do that because there's interstate commerce. Okay, but corporations are formed under what? Under state charter, right? Okay, okay, good. Now, this that you see on the board is every accountant's favorite song. Every accountant walks around going, assets, assets equal liabilities for stockholders' equity. Okay, it is every accountant's favorite song. Okay, now, assets will equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. We just saw that on the balance sheet, didn't we? The balance sheet must balance. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. Okay, if you fall asleep, I'm going to sing some more. Okay, assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. Now, when you look at this, you need to understand what these elements are. So, assets have future economic benefit. Assets have future economic benefit. An asset has future economic benefit. So, is cash an asset? If you don't think that cash is an asset, give me your cash right now. And you will say, oh, no, because that's my dinner tonight. It has future economic benefit, doesn't it? So cash is an asset because you can turn it into any future economic benefit you like, again, within the confines of the law, right? Okay, good. So is a piece of equipment an asset? Yeah, because I can use a delivery truck to make deliveries for my business in the future. Good. Is um, a building an asset? Yes. yes, because I can run my business out of it. So assets have future economic benefit like cash, right? Okay. Your liabilities are your bills. The first time I taught an accounting class, someone said to me, I don't understand what a liability is. And I was like, I had no answer because I had been teaching the CPA exam for years. By the time you get to the CPA exam, you're coming to me and pass the CPA exam, you know what a liability was. I was like, how do you not know what a liability is? How do I speak to this creature? And so finally I looked and I was like, wait a minute, liabilities, your liabilities are your bills, aren't they? Okay, your liabilities are your bills. Now, accounting sort of has its roots to a large extent. Um, the way we look at accounting currently has some roots in England back in the 1800s, okay, is when accounting firms and that for, thing started to emerge. You ever heard uh, A Christmas Carol? Scrooge and all that, and they were working long nights and all that. That was an accounting firm, okay? So what happens? Some things never change, okay? So what happens? I'm thinking liabilities, but in England they started calling them your bills. You call it your bills, right? You can almost hear that, right? So your liabilities are what? Are your bills, aren't they? Okay. Now, your stockholders' equity is what's left over after you get done dealing with your bills. So if you have what? $100 cash in your pocket in one pocket, but in the other pocket you have a $40 phone bill, do you really have a full $100 of future economic benefit? You actually only have what? 
$60 that's really yours, right? And when someone picks up your balance sheet, they would like to understand that. Yes, I see you have some cash. Oh, but I see that some of that cash is going to go to the cell phone company. So really, you only got 60 left, right? That is your ownership in that. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. That's what you hold left in the company, right? Yes, sir. So then you could also do assets minus liabilities equal stockholders' equity. That's correct. Assets minus liabilities will equal 60, right? That's correct. In other words, that's what's left over, right? Assets, after I pay my liabilities, minus the 40, I'm left with 60. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, and we, this just describes each one of them, which I've already done, so don't worry. There's nothing new on those slides. Okay, now, this is a little bit sloppy, but it is a nice little silly example for us to understand how we will go through, start up a business, make some income for the year, and make sure our balance sheet balances by the end of the year. Okay, so we're just going to go through a little example. So let's say I'm sitting at my house and uh, I don't have any money. Am I happy? No. no. People say, well, money doesn't make you happy. Who says that? People who have money. Okay. The people who don't have money say, well, it might help. I'll give it a shot. I'll try it. Okay. So what happens? So I don't have any money, so I'm not happy, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm like, how can I get some money? So I look in my backyard and there's a lemon tree sitting back there with 20 lemons on it. And I paid $20 for that lemon tree. So that means that I have what? I have lemons that are worth a dollar each, don't I? So I say, I know, I'm going to start selling these lemons. So I go and I start up a corporation and I bring in my asset, lemons. They have future economic benefit because I'm thinking I can sell them, right? And they're worth how much? $20 each, uh, excuse me, a dollar each, $20 total, right? 20 lemons, okay. And my owner's equity is $20. I want to make sure that the world knows that those lemons belong to me. But I'm putting it in a separate entity, right? This corporation. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take back stock from the corporation. And that stock evidences that what? I own those lemons, doesn't it? Okay. So the corporation balance sheet is going to say, yes, we have these lemons. And yes, there is somebody out there or some buddies. It doesn't have to be one person. There is somebody out there who what? owns these lemons and we have issued stock to them to evidence their ownership. So, does the balance sheet balance? Does my balance sheet balance at the beginning? Yes. $20 of assets equal what? Owner's equity, $20 of stock, right? That means there's somebody out there who owns this corporation, right? And what do they own? Right now they own $20 worth of lemons, don't they? Okay, now in this class, if you pick up the phone for a second and do it, you know, do a quick check. Did the A's win? Did the Giants lose? Whatever, okay. You want to do that, I'm not going to trip. But you cannot sit there the whole class and carry on a text uh, tirade with somebody, conversation with someone. That's not going to work. Okay, so you need to put it down and give it a little rest. Okay, and if I'm looking at you, you're not the one. Okay. All right, so what happens? We're sitting here and we have what? We have assets. We have people that own those assets and they've taken stock back, right? Okay, now what happens? We go and we decide to start selling the lemons and we sell the lemons at $5 each. Now, how much did we pay for those lemons? $1. How do you get people to buy lemons for $5 that only cost you a dollar? Don't say lemonade. It's just lemons. You gotta sell the lemons. Is price. Huh? Corner the market and mark up the price. Corner the market and up the price? Okay. Okay. Look, we're not we don't want the Federal Trade Commission after us. I don't mention the Federal Trade Commission, okay? Um, so you know, we'll go and kill all the other lemon trees in the world and then we can charge whatever we want for them, right? Huh? 
Okay. I'm thinking we're going to probably diff try to differentiate them somehow. So I don't know, even though every lemon looks the same, what we're going to start to do is we're going to start to what? We're going to start to spin our lemons. Okay, there are no side lectures in this class. There's one teacher, one lecture. If there's a question, the question comes up here. Okay, and you say that and you get upset when I say that, whatever. But the reality is that if I don't do that, I'll have 52 freaking lectures going on in here. Okay, and I can't have that. So is there a question? Okay, so we go ahead and we do what? We try to differentiate the lemons somehow, so we decide that our lemon, lemons are going to be worth $5 each, even though we only paid a dollar for them, because they are spinning lemons. So we start spinning the lemons, and we can spin them like no other. And people come up and go, look, spinning lemons. How much do you want for them? And we say, $5 each. They say, okay. So we sell what? We sell, I'm not $5 each, I'm sorry, guys, $3 each. Three dollars each. So we sell five lemons for what? Three dollars each. We have revenue of fifteen dollars, don't we? Not bad. Okay. Now what happens? We pulled the lemons off of the lemon tree, and now the lemon tree is kind of going. Ugh. So we say, uh oh, we don't want it to die. So we go and we get some fertilizer. So we go to the fertilizer store. Now we have what? Fifteen dollars. We go to the fertilizer store and we sell. We sell, we don't sell. We buy what? We buy seven dollars worth of fertilizer, don't we? So we spend seven dollars. We take the fertilizer back to the lemon tree and we dump it on the ground. Does it have any more future economic benefit? We'll say no, okay? Because uh, I'm maybe not using the best example because there are aspects of agricultural accounting that would say yes, okay? But just humor me, okay? When you dump something on the ground, what is it, the, the two-second rule? It no longer has to be a direct economic benefit. Okay, so we dump something on the ground, and it's like, ugh, no more future economic benefit, right? Any future economic benefit associated with that has expired, hasn't it? Future economic benefit has expired. So we would report what? We would report, ah, damn it, I jumped myself. I'll come back to that. I skipped something important, damn it. Okay, what happens? We have revenue 15, right? But we have to report the cost of those things we sold. Those lemons cost us what? A dollar each, didn't they? And we sold five of them. So we will report cost of lemons sold of $5. 15 minus 5 means we have something called gross profit of 10. We sold them for 15, but they cost us five. We have gross profit of 10, don't we? Okay, now, investors are very interested in the gross profit number. Nobody looks at gross profit and says, hey, you're looking a little chubby there. You might want to you know, go on a diet. You might want to start jogging. The, everyone says, oh, gross profit, it looks, little weight looks good on you. Okay, we are interested in what? A fat gross profit, aren't we, as potential investors? Because we want to see that there's something left over after this company's paid for whatever the hell it is they're selling, right? Nobody says, hey, you know, grim gross profit, why don't you slim down a little bit? We want a nice chunk of fat there, don't we? Ten in this example. Then what? Then we go and we get the fertilizer. We dump it on the ground. Okay, future economic benefit has expired. And we report fertilizer expense. There's no more future economic benefit left with that, right? So when we take our gross profit minus our expenses, we have net income of $3. We have net income of $3. Now, where does your net income go? Let me give you a hint. Huh? To where? To retain earnings. Yes, it goes to the piggy bank, doesn't it? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have my beginning balance. Guys, there is one lecture and one discussion that goes on in this class. 
the beginning balance is what? Zero because I just started this business. Remember I was sitting there with no money when I just started to have the business? Then I go ahead and I add net income, don't I? What's my net income? Three dollars. Do I have to pay a dividend? I do not. And I'm telling you that in this first year, I decided I'm not going to pay a dividend. I'm going to leave all the money in the piggy bank. So the ending balance, so I subtract dividend, even though I didn't have any. Subtract dividend, even though I didn't have any. And then my ending balance is what? $3, isn't it? The money I put in the piggy bank, my retained earnings. Okay. So we have now done what? We have now created an income statement. We have now created a what? Statement of stockholders' equity that you see on the board. That's the piggy bank. Beginning balance and retained earnings. Add net income. Subtract the dividends. Even if you don't have any dividend, you say subtract and zero or less and zero. And then you have the ending balance, don't you? Okay. Now we can prepare our balance sheet. So what happens? We had, what, 20 lemons that were at a dollar each? We sold how many? Five. We sold five. We sold them at $3 each. We sold five, didn't we? We sold five. That means we got, what, 15 lemons left at a dollar each? So these 15 lemons still have future economic benefit, don't they? And by the way, these are lemons that don't ever get rotten. Because sometimes I get stupid. Well, wait a minute, aren't they rotten by now? Don't worry, okay? They'll stay fresh, okay? So we have lemons of $15. We have cash of what? $8. The $15 cash sales minus the $7 that we paid the guy for the fertilizer. So we've got an ending balance of cash of $8, don't we? Okay, so our cash is what? $8. We report that. So our total assets is $23, is not it? 23, okay, we what? We still have the common stock of 20, don't we? Nothing happened with common stock. We issued that common stock. We held the stock. We didn't issue any more stock, so we only have $20 of stock out there still, right? And my retained earnings is what? $3, so my stockholder's equity is what? 23. Does the balance sheet balance? Assets equal what? There's no liabilities equal, in this case, liabilities are zero, so stockholders' equity is 23. Does the balance sheet bounce? Yes. You just prepared a income statement, a statement of retained earnings, and a balance sheet. Okay, now, stockholders' equity, for our purposes for quite a while in this class, is going to be comprised of what? Common stock and retained earnings. Stockholders' equity is going to be comprised of common stock and retained earnings. Does the balance sheet balance? Yep. Mm -hmm. if not, well, if not, we've made a mistake, but we apparently did not make a mistake because this balance sheet balances, doesn't it? Yep. Can you explain the cash again? Um, I don't yeah, think of your own cash. No, I mean, it's eight, but um, the net income is three. So think of your own cash. If you have $15 and you spend seven, how many dollars do you have left? Eight. Eight. That's why it's eight. Because That's it. Have $10. You're trying to make a connection that ain't there. So I want you to stick to what we're doing right here. How much cash do you have? Eight. Eight. You had 15. You spent seven. You've got eight dollars of cash left. There is no connection between net income and cash. They are not the same thing. So if you want to ask me about cash, ask me about cash. I can't give you an answer that ties cash to net income because they're not the same thing. The cash that you're left with has nothing to do with your net income. Okay, so if you want me to explain cash, it's what you started with, zero, plus what you got, minus what you spent. You've got eight. If you want to ask me about net income, net income is revenue minus expense minus my cost of my item, revenue, minus my cost of my items, gives me gross profit, minus my expenses. And that's net income.
and they do not, and they frequently will not match. Yes, sir. Uh, could you express uh, retained earnings as being net income minus dividends? Yeah. Yes. It, well, excluding the beginning balance, because uh, let me go into year two, okay, and it kind of ties to your question a little bit, okay? So when we go into, that's year one, right? Now, when we go into year two now, we continue on. And in year two, we sell seven lemons. Seven lemons, we sell them for $3 each, so we generate revenue of 21. Let me try to answer your question a little better because I just thought of something. Is it, is one of the reasons that there's a difference between net income and the cash? We got cash for lemons, didn't we? We gave up lemons and got cash, but we recognized the cost of those lemons, didn't we? So that's why there's, that's one of the many reasons that there will be difference between the amount of cash that we generate and the net income, right? Because we had to recognize the cost of the things that we sold. Okay. okay and, th and some of that didn't use up cash, right? Okay. The, co the cost of the lemons. Okay. So we have what? We have revenue, seven lemons, $3 each, 21, but those lemons cost us a dollar each, didn't they? So it's a dollar each. That's cost of goods sold of seven. Our gross profit is 14, right? Now, often what we do in business, if something worked last year, we do it again this year. So since the lemon tree didn't die last year, we go back to the fertilizer store, and we're going to get another bag of fertilizer that's going to cost $7, right? This time, though, the fertilizer guy goes, you're the spinning lemon guy. I read about you in the fertilizer journals. You're that guy that's like, you're an up-and-coming lemon guy. You're going to have a whole lemon ranch pretty soon, huh? And you say, well, as a matter of fact, I am, right? The guy says, hey, 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 don't worry. Pay me next year. Take the bag of fertilizer. Pay me next year. Now, why does this guy do that? No, he's not an investor because he said pay me back. Investors give you your money, their money and they say, maybe I'll get it back, maybe I won't. I'm just hoping when you get the ranch, you're going to buy all your fertilizer. Right? That's what made America great. Not Trump. Credit. <laughs> Credit made America great. You look around, you see all of these houses, all of these buildings, all of these cars and assets and things going all over the place, airplanes flying. Credit. Nobody's paid for any of it. Huh? It's also what theoretically made Trump great. He got a huge line of credit, and then that's what made everybody think he had assets. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> I still can't figure out his hair, okay, because <laughs> I wore a toupee for years. For seven years, I wore a toupee. When I first started losing my hair, I was going to get a toupee. I wore a toupee for seven years, so I kind of like study people's hair, okay? <laughs> that's real, that's real, that's real. I get to Trump and I'm like, man, you know, he's confused me. I give him credit for that. I don't know, is it real? Is it, it swirls around? It looks like a cotton candy machine in motion, but then when the wind blows, it looks normal? I don't know. Anyway, so what's my point? Credit, right? Credit is what made America great. And and exactly your point. And the, the lemon, the uh, excuse me, the fertilizer guy is probably sitting there. And this guy's an up and coming. If he grows this business, I'm his guy because I was the first one that extended him credit. He'll come and get all his fertilizer over here, right? So I take the bag of fertilizer and I don't pay for it. I'm going to pay him next year, right? I don't give him any cash. So what happens? I take the bag of fertilizer and I dump it on the ground. Is there any more future economic benefit? No, no, no. It has expired. It has expired. So I will still report it as what? Expense of $7. And now I have a bill to pay the fertilizer, uh, fertilizer store back $7, don't I? Yes. Okay. So now when I look at this, I've got revenue minus my cost of goods sold gives me gross profit. I take out my expenses. My fertilizer has no more future economic benefit. It has expired. That gives me a net income of what? Seven dollars, right? Okay. Now what happens? Now I can prepare my piggy bank 
What's your name, sir? The gentleman with the Ricky Henderson shirt? Uh, sir. Huh? Sir Retzi. Sir Retzi? Yep. Uh, sir Retzi. Now, because you kind of asked me if it's net income minus dividends, and I started to say, well, wait a minute. We have to have the beginning balance. So now in year two, if this is year two, my beginning balance is last year's ending balance, isn't it? So I ended last year with three, but now I have net income of what? Seven. So my, assuming no dividends again, my ending balance is what? Ten. My beginning balance plus my, divid, uh, plus my net income, and I'm saying right now, anyway, that I haven't paid any dividends, so the dividend is zero. So the ending balance is 10, right? So, Soretzi, just to answer your question now uh, a little more directly, it's what? Beginning balance plus net income minus dividends gives me my ending balance. And that goes on throughout the whole life of the corporation, right? This ending balance of uh, $10 will become year three's beginning balance and so on. Add year three's net income minus the dividends if I have any in year three and so on. Okay, but there's my statement of retained earnings, isn't it? Yeah. I got my statement of retained earnings now, and now I can do my balance sheet. How much cash do I have? I started the year with what? You think of your own cash. I started the year with 15, no, incoming cash are not the same thing. I started the year with $15 of cash, didn't I? Right, and then what? Then I went ahead and I sold the lemons, and it was what, $21? Came in, is that what, 39? 29? What am I doing? Yeah, why is that not right? Why did I get 29 here? I didn't start the year with 15, guys. I started the year with what? I started the year with $8, right? What you report in cash is like your wallet. If you stop, stop. If you go to sleep with $8 in your wallet on December 31st, how much money is in your wallet on January 1st? Eight. Eight? Why are you looking at me like that? I scared you? If you, if, because I don't want you to start thinking weird things, okay? It's as simple as I'm telling you. If you end, if you go to sleep on December 31st with $8 in your wallet, how much do you wake up with on, on January 1st? Eight dollars. Okay, so last year's ending balance of eight dollars rolls forward to the beginning balance of what? Eight dollars when I start the new year, doesn't it? Right? Okay, and then I sold what? And then I sold twenty-one dollars worth of lemons, so that means by the end of the year I had what? Twenty-nine dollars cash? Don't overthink this, guys. The cash is the easiest thing in the world. Think of your wallet. If you, you okay, it's New Year's Eve. You have $8 in your wallet. You're supposed to go out to celebrate New Year's Eve. Your friends stiff you. So you go to sleep 9 o'clock New Year's Eve. You don't even wait for 12 o'clock. When you wake up the next morning, isn't the $8 supposed to still be in your wallet? Unless you have some really shady friends that snuck in and stole the eight dollars out, but assuming, you know, you that didn't happen, you still have eight dollars, don't you? Then you start the new year and you do what? You generate twenty-one dollars of cash by selling what? By selling seven lemons for three dollars uh, for three dollars each, don't you? So now you got twenty-one dollars of cash. So by the end, and we didn't pay the fertilizer guy. We didn't pay him. We kept that cash, didn't we? We're getting ready to pay him. Then he said, no, 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 no. Pay me next year. So I kept that $29 in my pocket, didn't I? So I end the year with what? I end the year with $29. Why is that hard? It's not. I get it. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> You're just like in awe of. Because, well, here's the thing. Because uh, I appreciate. We, uh, okay. Okay. I tell new teachers when I bring them on to teach at uh, the review course, if your students are looking at you like a spaceship landed, that's bad. Okay, so you kind of had the spaceship landed look on your face. Okay, all right, so you're good? I'm good. Okay, all right. So what happens? You're still tripping off. I wonder what you look like with the toupee. Okay, <laughs> it did not look as good as your hair does, trust me. Okay, it looked awful. You know, you go through your whole life thinking that you're getting away with that, and then you take it off. The first thing everybody thinks is you're going to go, you know, 
postal. When you walk in, you have a pompadour one day, and the next day you walk in with nothing. You know, but then everybody, once they realize you haven't lost it, they say, oh, you know, I always wondered why you wore that thing. I was like, oh, I thought everybody knew, didn't know, I thought nobody knew. Okay, so what happens? You sit here and focus, John. You have what? You had lemons. You started out with 20. You sold what? You sold five the first year, so you had 15. You sold what? Seven the second year, so you still have eight lemons left, don't you? The non-rotting lemons. Okay, you still got eight of those left. So my total assets are cash plus the lemons is 37, isn't it? The cash plus the lemons. Is cash an asset? Are lemons an asset that I can still sell in the future? Yes. Okay, so I have total assets of what, 37? But now I have a bill, don't I? I have this liability, that $7 I owe the fertilizer guy. So now I report a liability of $7. My what, common stock is still 20. I took that stock back and I've just held it, haven't I? And what? And my retained earnings is now last year's beginning balance plus this year's net income is 10, isn't it? Does the balance sheet balance? We know what we're doing here, don't we? The balance sheet balances, right? 10 plus, uh, 10 plus 20 is 30 plus 7 is 37. And my assets are 37. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. Does the balance sheet balance? Huh? Balance sheet balances? Okay, good. Good. Now, let's pay a dividend. So I decide I want to take a dollar out for a dividend. If I take a dollar out for a dividend, this 37 is going to become, uh, well, the cash is going to become, what, 28? And this 37 is going to become, what, 36? Okay, and since I've taken a dollar out of the piggy bank, now I'll report a dividend of a dollar, and so my retained earnings will now be what? Will now be nine. Okay, and will the balance sheet still balance? Yes. Balance sheet will still balance. Nine plus 20 is 29, plus seven is 36. My assets are 36, right? Okay, and all I would have to do is over here on my statement retained earnings is go ahead and uh, show a subtract of $1 for a dividend. I show that subtract of $1, ending balance is now what? $9. Yes, sir. So with the common stock still being 20 in the following year, that just assumes the value of the stock doesn't fluctuate. There's common stock. The value of the stock could be doing anything. I will still report it at $20 because that's what I issued it for. Okay. Now, don't confuse that with what we were talking about. If a company makes an investment in stock, now they've bought the stock. When we're reporting stock down in my stockholder's equity, that means that I as a corporation am the one that sold the stock for somebody, to somebody. And I sold the stock to myself, essentially. I formed the corporation as a corporation, the board of directors. Right, I'm sitting here. Okay, board meeting. I'm the only one in the board meeting. Do we want to sell stock to John? Yes. So I sell stock to John, and I do what? I sell 20, um, whatever, how many shares, $20 worth of stock to John, and now John gives me lemons back in exchange, right? So I had lemons, I had stock, and that stays the same. doesn't matter what's happening with the value of my stock on the market. Now, theoretically, I could sell you my stock. So I sell you my stock, and I say, give me $23 for it. And you say, okay, give me $27 for it. You say, okay. I give you the stock. I take $27 from you. Now you own whatever's in this corporation, and you still, though, only have $20 of stock because that's still outside. All we've done is what? Changed owners outside of the company. That's why we say one of the advantages of corporations ease and change in ownership. All I do is sell you my stock. As far as the corporation's concerned, there's still twenty dollars worth of stock sitting out there, right? So that stockholder's equity or that stock, I should say, account will not change unless I issue more stock. So if I have more stock to issue, then more stock would go out 
and that would change that number. Okay. So, so in other words, technically, like if you uh, give your like employees stock options and like you issued like ten thousand stocks and they were all bought for like a dollar a share or whatever, so it's ten thousand total, and then the employees sell the stock to other people, but the, it's still going to be ten thousand. It would still be ten thousand because the corporation did not issue additional shares. And it doesn't matter what the secondary market did with the trading of that stock, what the value is, I still report it at what uh, what I issued it for. It stays at what I issued it for. So fluctuations in the market of my stock do not affect my stockholder's equity account. He is, his arm's getting tired. <laughs> so assuming the guy got a $27 deal, deal and it stays consistent where the stock stays at $20, what would that additional $7 turn into? Well, no. That extra $7 is money now. I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy now because what, did I, what have I done? I have turned $20 of lemons into $27 cash, haven't I? And that's based on my genius. But I mean for the guy that actually bought the stock. Well, now he's bought something for $27, and he's looking at it, and he's saying, let's say he says, you know, John, you've done a good job so far, okay? But, you know, you're not the best uh, business manager. I think I can do better. You keep pulling, the, uh, put, you keep dumping a whole bag of fertilizer on the ground every year, and I think we could get away with dumping a half a bag of fertilizer. In fact, I own a fertilizer distribution company that I can get a good deal on fertilizer, so why don't you do this? Why don't you give me your stock for $20 and that, that, that was issued for $20. I'll give you $27. You go down the road, and you have a nice life. Maybe it's $27 million. And maybe I say, okay, $20 worth of lemons, and now he's giving me $27 million. I go down the road, now I got all this money, right? And I achieve my objective of making more money, right? Now what happens? Now you have the $20 of stock, right? Now you have the ability to control what's going to happen with this business. So when you go into, say this happens at the end of year two, when you go to year three, you say, okay, I've got access now to the spinning lemon formula, you know, and by the way, an intangible asset like that, if you there was a formula and you bought it, that would be reported as an asset. Now, we'd have another asset, the spinning lemon formula, but that's way be, we're going too far. But you say, okay, I now own this lemon business, right? I bought it for $27. There's $20 of stock. You still have to pay the fertilizer guy. You still got to pay the fertilizer guy. And I've got what? I've got these, um, I've got these, um, this cash, you know, that was sitting in the cash accounts at $8. And I've got these lemons that are um, this $28 cash. I got these $8 of lemons. And I'm going to see if I can make this grow some more. But right now, there's still only $20 of stock, right? And I'm down the road with $7. With $27. One last question. Um, so, so, in other, so, in other words, like the valuation of a company is completely different from like the asset slash equity of a company. So, like, yes. they have zero to do with each other. Yeah, go ahead. Try to buy Apple for what they say their assets are. Go ahead, try it. Look at the assets on Apple's balance sheet and then walk into Apple and say, here, I don't know how many of their assets, how much their assets, here, I now own Apple. Try it. And the balance sheet will balance, won't it? Assets will equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. Go ahead. Try it. Look at the, num the amount that's shown as assets on Apple's financial report and see if you can buy the whole company for that. You cannot. Because what happens? Along with Apple comes what? Comes a brand name. Comes a potential for more product down the line. Comes a potential for whatever sort of research they've got going on that they're going to be developing. So the company's value is worth more than just the assets that are sitting there trying to generate that value. Right? And so... When we have that stock down here, all that represents is the stock that I've issued to my investors that is now in their hands. They hold that stock. I need to show that I've issued that stock to somebody, so I show my stockholders my stock, my common stock account. I show that, 
but that doesn't change unless I issue more stock. That'll cause it to change. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. The investors are very interested in this income statement. They're sitting there and they're going, looky, looky, $3 the first year, $7 the next year. That means that there should be, I don't know, uh, $14, I don't know, the next year, and so on, and 20 and so on, and this is going to keep going, right? So they're very interested in that. They're very interested in, yeah, but he's got this big cough up for equipment that's coming. So the balance sheet is also important in many respects, right? Look at all that cash he has. Oh, Grandma, what big cash you have, right? What happens? They're going to sit there and say, hmm, you know, I don't know that John knows what he's doing with all that cash. I've got some ideas. Let's pull some cash out and let's go get that fertilizer distributor distribution. And we can use some of that cash that's sitting there to do that, et cetera. No. No, not necessarily, but you're asking good questions. No, um, I could have what they call angel investors. I can have, they call it Series A, Series B. There are different series before you go public that there's certain dollar amounts that tend to be associated with those series. And those would still be uh, what they call venture capitalists that are coming in and they're waiting for that big day when I finally go public, and that's when they tend to get their payoff when I go public, then they sell all the shares that they've had as part of this public offering. What they do is typically uh, series, early series investors, angel investors, they take back preferred stock. And then what they do is they sell the preferred stock for the common stock. They exchange the preferred stock for the common stock, and then they sell the common stock, and that's how they make their money off the IPO. There is not an unlimited amount of stock that a company can issue. When a company incorporates with the state, they are authorized so many shares. Okay, so let's say I was authorized 10,000 shares, and let's say I issued 8,000 shares to get this $20. That doesn't make my stock worth, my par value, my stock's not very high, but whatever. Let's say I still have 2,000 shares left. I could still issue an additional 2,000 shares. That's my point, that stock, common stock account won't change unless I issue more shares. I don't have to issue all my shares initially. I don't have to ever issue all my shares. But I would be stopped at the number of shares that I'm authorized. Now, it's probably possible, I don't know, for me to go and amend my charter to get more shares authorized. Okay. And does that first transaction set the price of the shares? Um, because you, you mentioned that if you issue 8,000, that means your shares aren't very... Well, I, I assumed here that I issued the common stock at par, something they call par, par, because there was no account called additional paid in capital in excess of par. If a company issues their common stock for more than par, they would still show common stock at par, and they would create an account called additional paid in capital in excess of par for the amount over par value that the stock got issued. You asked. Sometimes you can't ask, you not, you can't expect to understand the information before you're ready to understand the information. Okay, so this is what I issued the shares for at par value, twenty dollars, because there is no account called additional paid in capital in excess of par. Usually, companies will issue the common stock for more than their par value. That's going to be the market value. They'll issue the stock at par, and then they'll show additional paid in capital in excess at par. Okay. Okay, good. Now, when we look at the accounting equation, then, you can see that we have assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. We know that, right? And we know that right now the, common, the stockholders' equity is what? 
common stock and retain earnings, isn't it? And what? The fluid part of this thing is the retained earnings, right? Of the stockholders' equity is not the common stock, but what? The retained earnings, because we have revenues minus expenses. Revenue minus expenses generates what? Good, generates net income. I don't know why this pen started doing this. There's something wrong with it. Okay, revenue minus expenses equals what? Net income. And then my what? My net income goes into what? Goes into the piggy bank, goes into the retained earnings. And then I do what? I subtract out the dividends. Okay. That's what constitutes retained earnings. The revenue minus expenses, report on the income statement. Net income then flows to the what? Statement of retained earnings. Okay. So let's look at this thing again now. We already looked at this. Revenue minus expenses give me what? Net income. Net income goes into my piggy bank, my retained earnings. I add it to the beginning balance. If I just started the business, the beginning balance is zero. I do what? I pull out my dividends, don't I? That's what's left is if I take money out of my retained earnings, have I retained it? No. If I take something out of something, have I retained it? No, I pull that out and I'm left with what? 1450 here. My retained earnings. Okay? Then I prepare my balance sheet. My balance sheet is my assets equal liabilities plus my stockholders equity. My stockholders equity is comprised of my common stock and my retained earnings. That's why retained earnings has flowed down has flowed down here. Right? And the balance sheet bounces, just like our balance sheet bounced. Now, accounting, if I was a music teacher, accounting would be my trumpet, would be my instrument. And you ever see, like, um, you know, music teacher for elementary school kids, they're always, <laughs> oh, no! Because the students are destroying their life, their passion, their music. Oh, oh, no. You ever seen that with a music teacher? They're all haggard. <laughs> okay. That's how I am about accounting. So if you say to me that cash is on the income statement, I'll go, oh. <laughs> on the income statement is net income. Net income is revenue minus expenses, isn't it? There's no cash there. It's revenue minus expenses. No cash on the income statement. That's net income, right? Okay. When we get to the balance sheet, it's what? Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. Assets are things that have future economic benefit. Is cash an asset? Yes. Then cash is on the balance sheet, isn't it? Yes. Is equipment an asset? Yes, it is, and it's on the balance sheet, isn't it? Liabilities are payables are what? On the balance sheet, aren't they? Okay. My stockholder's equity, which makes the balance sheet balance, is retain earnings and what? Stock. Common, common stock. It comprises stockholder's equity. Okay. I, you need to know what statement these things appear on, right? Statement of retained earnings is easy. Beginning balance retained earnings plus net income minus the dividends gives me ending balance. Actually, it's all easy. Yes, sir. So the income sheet should be the same, have the same uh, ending value as the, the other sheet. The income statement shows net income. Right. Revenue minus expenses. So in their balance, uh, that's okay, never mind, never mind. Yeah, the balance sheet is assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. So, so you just carry over the income sheet into the, into the other one as, uh, as, as retained earnings? 
I flow my net income from the income statement. I'm the music teacher. Don't call it an income sheet. It's the income statement to the statement of retained earnings, right? And it adds to my retained earnings? It adds to my retained earnings? Okay. Question? Common stock, that's where the fair value principle would come in, right? No. Common stock is whatever I issued the stock for. Okay. Okay, fair value concept would come in if I, as a corporation, bought the stock of another corporation. Okay. Now that's an asset, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So that's where the fair value concept would come in because I've acquired an asset that the whole world agrees as to what its fluctuating value is from period to period. Okay. So for that reason, FASB said you can carry an investment like stock at fair value. For items like equipment and whatnot, we do not use fair value. We use historical cost because of the subjectivity associated with the value of a fixed asset like land or whatever. Okay. So for like the lemon tree, I think I was just kind of confused because the common stock was the same price for what you bought the lemon tree for, $20. So that's why I thought it might have been the fair value principle that well, I brought the lemon tree into the company at $20, and in that particular s s assumption there was that it, I said it cost me $20, so it really cost the corporation $20 worth of stock, okay? okay? And so the corporation brought it in for $20 and issued stock worth $20. But they wish you, when they issue the stock, that's showing that somebody owns those lemons, right? And so I just report the common stock at $20. That's what I issued out in exchange for lemons. So when I prepare that initial balance sheet, that's why we had lemons $20. We had common stock $20. That's showing that the corporation issued stock and took back something of value of $20. Okay. okay, and I brought that in, and I was satisfied with that. When I first started the thing, I said, okay, now I got $20 of stock. I could have looked at it this way. That same day, I could have taken the $20 stock that the corporation issued me, and I could have said, you know what, forget it. I don't want to do this lemon thing. Okay, so I'd say, you know, I wanted money, didn't I? And I had $20 of lemons, and I put them in the corporation, and I took back the stock, and then the next day, I... I fall in love and I want to go to Europe and forget this lemon tree thing. So I look around for some uns you know, unsuspecting person. I say, hey, hey, I'll sell you this stock for $20 and you get those lemons that are sitting in the corporation, right? So I sell you the stock. You give me $20. Now you have $20 of stock. That now you're the owner of that stock and what do you got? You got $20 worth of lemons sitting there as the assets of that corporation, right? You turn around the next day and you say to somebody else, hey, you see that $20 worth of lemons? I think it's worth $23. Huh? I'll buy it. You'll buy it? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so you decide now that you're going to pay $23 because you're looking and you're saying, okay, lemon business, I got some ideas. And at least I don't have to go find a lemon tree now. So what do you do? You take, give him $23. He's got $23. You have what? $20 worth of lemons still, don't you? And the corporation has issued $20 of stock that first was held by me, that then went to somebody else, that then went to somebody else. The corporation didn't get that $3. The old owner got the $3, and he took off to, where are you going? You're going to Europe too? We're going, to, we're going together? Okay, so you just sit there and you say, hey, you know, I'm going to Europe too, you know. So what happens? That's now what? You're gone and there's still, what, just the $20 of stock that's been issued, right? And that sits there like that. And I don't care what happens to the value of that stock unless the corporation issues more stock, that $20 will stay the same, right? Because that's all they've issued. That's all they've issued. And you're saying, well, yeah, John, but the assets have gone up and up and up. Yeah, we've got an account for that in our stockholder's equity account. It's called retained earnings. The growth in wealth of this company is being reflected in the stockholders' equity, not in the common stock account, but in what? Retain earnings. And the fact that people are willing to pay more in the secondary market for that stock does not affect what the company issued the stock for. 
So that's why that doesn't change. Now, if I buy the, if I, a corporation, I buy stock, that's an asset, isn't it? Yeah. And now I'm the one that owns the stock of somebody else. Then, yeah, then the fluctuation in the market of that stock is accruing to me, right? Because I can sell that for a different price now. Yeah. I think we are ready for a break. So why don't we go ahead and uh, take what? Maybe uh, 10, uh, I'd like to say 15, but if I say 15, it's almost time to leave. So let's just do 10 minutes. We'll come back at a quarter till, okay? So I'm just and um, what we're going to do now is go through this little exercise and um, what we're going to see is how these different business transactions will affect our assets equal our liabilities plus our stockholders equity with the understanding that stockholders equity is common stock and what retain earnings right okay so let's just take a look minus any dividends uh, revenue minus expenses gives net income minus any dividends right okay so we start to take a look at this and uh, they have this Ray and Barbara Neal decide to open a computer programming service and I don't know why they just left the naming of it exclusively up to him, okay, because it says he names it. How come they didn't name it SoftBite, but they say he names it SoftBite. And so on September 1st, 2015, they invest $15,000 cash into the company, so in exchange for common stock. So when you bring cash into the company, will your cash account go up? When cash comes into a company, will your cash account go up? Yes. They're not putting lemons in, they're putting cash in, aren't they? So we know that cash is going to go up. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. Since the corporation issued stock, now common stock has to go up, doesn't it? Just like our $20 of common stock went up when we issued the stock. In exchange, in that case, it was lemons. Okay, so what happens? Cash goes up 15, common stock goes up 15. Does the balance sheet bounce? Does the balance sheet bounce? Okay. Then they go ahead, their cash is in the corporation, they took back stock. Then they go ahead and they purchase computer equipment for $7,000. Is computer equipment an asset? Yes. Okay, so my equipment asset's going to go up, and since they paid cash, my cash account's going to go down, isn't it? So I'm essentially just changing one asset for another. My cash came down seven. My what equipment went up seven. So I still have fifteen thousand dollars worth of assets, don't I? And what my common stock is still sitting there at fifteen thousand. I haven't issued any more common stock, have I? So it's still sitting there at fifteen thousand. Okay. Okay. Good. Then what happens? Then I go and I purchase, they purchase, whatever, $1,600 from Ackley Supply Company for computer paper and other supplies expected to last several months. Why does it matter that it's going to last several months? No. If something lasts several months, does it have future economic benefit? Then the what? Then the computer paper is going to be an asset supplies, right? So I did what? I got the supplies and I got the supplies on credit. I got the supplies on credit. That means I'm going to pay for it later, right? If I say I got it on credit, that means I'm going to pay for it later. If you're going to pay for something later, do you have a bill? Okay, now. When I see a comment, a business transaction being described that they've got something on credit, I don't have to think. I automatically have a reflex that that's a liability, right? You are not in that position, so you need to ask me. If you read a transaction and we treat it as a liability and you're not sure why, you need to ask me because I've lost that perspective to look at it and not know automatically what that means, right? 
So if I describe a transaction to you and you're like, huh? How do I know that was on credit? How do I know that was a liability? How do I know they didn't pay cash? You need to ask me because sometimes it's just poorly written and that's the reason. Okay, I look at these, I automatically know, right? Okay, but here they said on credit, that means I'm going to pay later, right? Okay, so if they're going to pay later, will they still get the supplies? Okay, so my asset's going to go up 1600 isn't it? And then what? My liabilities are also going to go up 1600 because now I'm going to have a bill for that. Did the equation stay in balance? We added to the asset side, we added to the liability plus stockholders' equity side, right? By adding to the liabilities. Okay. Okay, good. Then I take a look and we say that SoftBite receives 1200 cash from customers for programming services it has provided. Now, when you generate money in the business that you're in, providing some sort of service, whatever, that is called revenue. So is my revenue going to go up? Yes. My revenue is going to go up, and it was what? For cash? So my cash is going to go up, right? Now, my cash goes up 1200 and the equation stays in balance because what? Because my revenue went up 1200 If my revenue went up 1200 there's no expenses right now. Then my net income right now is 1200 isn't it? If my net income is 1200 did my retained earnings increase? So my balance sheet balances because what? My retained earnings is part of my stockholder's equity, isn't it? And so my stockholder's equity went up, so the equation balances, right? So right now, I have my revenue. If I'm preparing my income statement, I have revenue of what? How much was this? 1200 Right now, my expenses are what? Where did you get 7,000 of expenses? That's equipment, 7,000. Equipment has future economic benefit that has not expired. So it is not an expense. It's an asset, isn't it? Assets are reported on the balance sheet. Expenses are reported on the income statement. Expenses happen when I have incurred a cost and there is no more future economic benefit associated with it. So right now I have no expenses, right? Everything's been treated as an asset. So my expenses are zero. My net income is what? 1200 And since they just started their business, the beginning balance in the retained earnings is what? Is this my retained earnings? My retained earnings beginning balance is what? Zero. They just started the business, didn't they? Yeah. I have net income now of what? 1200 My dividends, at least right now, are what? No, I'm talking about the dividend. Dividends are zero, so that means that what? Ending balance in the retained earnings is how much? 1,200. Ending balance retained earnings is 1,200. Then my stockholders' equity has gone up 1,200, hasn't it? Because stockholders' equity is common stock and retained earnings. So the balance sheet balances. The asset cash came up. My stockholders' equity came up by the same amount. The balance sheet still balances. Okay? Okay, good. Now, what happens? Now I go and they incur an expense, but they're going to pay that expense later. So they get a bill for 250 for this advertising expense. Okay, now advertising, they're treating it as expense because, and this isn't the best example, FASB tells us to you to treat advertising as an expense because it's very difficult to measure if that advertising campaign is having future economic benefit or not. So since you don't really know, when you're trying this, let's try this advertising thing, see what happens. You don't really know. If you don't really know, FASB says just treat it as an expense. Okay, so we're going to treat the advertising as an expense. So my expenses are going to go up to 50. Meanwhile, my liabilities are going to go up. 250, aren't they? 
Now they're showing expense as a minus, but really my expenses went from zero right here to what? 250. The expenses actually went up, didn't they? From zero to 250. Okay, so if my expenses went up to 250, revenue minus expenses, my net income is now what? My net income is now 950. Calculators, guys. God made calculators for accountants. God looked down on accountants and said, that's not right. They should not have to do all that without a calculator. Let there be calculators. You bring a calculator to this class. Okay, so what happens? I know your elementary school teacher said, oh, no, don't use a calculator. Show that you really understand. I don't care. I don't care if you can't add 5 plus 1. I could care less because they created a calculator to do that for us. And I don't want your mind boggled. What's 5 minus 1 again? Mommy, mommy, mama. Okay, I don't want all that happening. I want you to put 5 minus 1 and give me the right number. 6, right? Okay, whatever. I am, I am horrible at math. I can never calculate a number in my head. You give me the number, I know what to do with it. For an accountant, though. Okay, so that's why I want the numbers. Okay, in the calculator. Okay, so this is 950. Okay, good. So now my net income is not 1,200 anymore. It's what? 950, isn't it? And if my what? If my net income is 950, assuming no dividends yet, and the beginning balance is zero, then my ending balance and retained earnings is 950, right? So what happened? My liabilities went up. My expenses went up. Because my expenses came up, my retained earnings came down. The equation stayed in balance, didn't it? Okay. Okay, good. Now what? Now they uh, provide services and they get some cash of uh, 1500 The remaining 2000 of this total 3500 of services they're going to provide, they've provided, is going to be paid later, meaning they will receive it later. If you're going to receive money later, do you have future economic benefit? Yes. We call that asset, that future economic benefit, accounts receivable, because we're going to receive it later. That's a receivable. It's on its way, or it will be soon. So it has future economic benefits. So what's going to happen? My cash is going to go up 15. They're going to give me 2,000 later. Would you do this? Would you do work and say, hey, pay me later? You do it all the time. If you've ever had a job, you've done it. You go over there and you mop the floor. You swing this. You say, hello, would you like this someone there? And you, oh, you, do, you, give, you give them all your wonderful thoughts. And they don't give you any money. You wait till the end of the week, don't you? And say, okay, now pay me. So you have a receivable during that time. It hasn't come yet. You know it's coming, but it's not there yet. And you definitely got future economic benefit. I know you do because I know on Thursday you're saying, hey, I'm going to get paid tomorrow, so we're going to go and have some future economic benefit. <laughs> right? Okay, so the fact that that money's coming is an asset, isn't it? And we call that asset accounts receivable. Okay, so what happens? We sit here. We got some cash up front. They're going to pay us 2000 later. My assets went up 3500 What happens? My revenue went up 3500 didn't it? If my revenue went up 3500 now my revenue is what? It went from 12 to 3700 4700 See, I told you. I'm telling you. This brain does not do math. If someone says to me, what's 5 plus 2? I go, hang on a minute. Let me get my phone. 5 plus 2, 7. When I first got my CPA, everybody started doing this. We'd go out to, you know, um, team lunches and all that. I just got my CPA, and it's before we all carried around calculators on our cell phones. And they say, here, John, figure out the bill. 
we go to a team dinner, right? So now what? Now it's, you know, $173 and I have to divide it by four because I'm a CPA. I'm thinking, I couldn't do this in the it's fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and I still can't do it. I don't know. Now I'm half slosh trying to sit here and take 174 divided by 8. That's not happening. Okay, so 4,700 minus 250 is what? 4,000 what? 450. Okay, so now my net income is 4,450. So my, um, if my net income's come up, has my retained earnings come up? If my net income's come up, has my retained earnings come up? Okay. And so the equation stayed in balance by the fact that what? Assets went up, net income went up, thus retained earnings went up, right? Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. Stockholders' equity is common stock and retained earnings. If revenue goes up, net income goes up. Net income goes up, what happens? No, I already said revenue goes up. If revenue goes up, net income goes up. If net income goes up, what goes up? Retain earnings. Retain earnings is part of stockholders' equity, isn't it? Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. My retained earnings part of my stockholders' equity came up by the amount of the um, revenue here, didn't it? And what did I get? I got some cash, which has future economic benefit, and I got a receivable that has future economic benefit. Okay, good. Now we pay some expenses. And we pay them in cash. So the cash is going down. My expenses, they show them one at a time. And it's a little confusing. They keep showing with subtracts. But because the, they're subtracting it from retained earnings, right? Because my revenue, my expenses are going up though, aren't they? So 6 plus 9 plus 2. My expenses have gone up 1700 And so... 250 plus the 1700 gives me how much? 9250. Okay, in America we call that 1900. What's 19250? I don't even know what that is. How much is it? Say it to me in English. Didn't you say 250 Yeah. 1950, 1950. Okay. Okay. 1,950? Okay. Good. 4,700 minus 1,950 is what? Go ahead. Keep trying not to do with the calculator. Go ahead. And then the day of the exam is going to come, and you're going to sit there and say, Professor, can I borrow a calculator? Huh? 2750 Good. So my net income came down, didn't it? Because my expenses went up. If my net income comes down, my retained earnings comes down, doesn't it? 2750 So now my retained earnings is 2750 right? So my asset came down. My stockholder's equity came down because my expenses went up. My net income came down. Therefore, my retained earnings came down. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholder's equity. Retain earnings as part of my stockholders' equity, right? Okay. Okay, good. They pay that liability. When you pay the liability, you pay cash out, don't you? Asset came down. Liability came down. Equation stays in balance. They receive some of the money from that account receivable. If I receive money from somebody that's supposed to give me money, do they still owe me the same amount? No, they don't owe me, what, 2000 anymore. They owe me 1400 don't they? And so what am I going to do? I'm going to subtract 600 from that asset and add 600 to this asset called cash, right? The equation stays in balance. And then they take a dividend. Cash goes down. What happens? They're showing dividends as a subtract because it's going to be a subtract from retained earnings. But my dividend went from zero to what? To 1300 So dividend goes up, retained earnings comes down, doesn't it? And now my retained earning balance is what? 
1450. So my retained earnings came down by the amount of dividend. Now notice these balances down here. Cash 8050, accounts receivable 14, supplies 16, equipment 7, accounts payable 16, common stock 15, revenue 47, 1950 of expenses, dividends 1300. See those numbers? We can now use those numbers to prepare financial statements. There it is. Revenue is what? 4700. Expenses 1950. My net income is what? 2750. My net income goes into my piggy bank. I have 2750 net income. Beginning balance was zero minus the dividend. There's my statement of retained earnings, right? And then you saw the balance sheet amounts on here. Cash is 8050, etc. So I go to the balance sheet, cash is 80.50, et cetera. The balance sheet balances, doesn't it? Yes, sir. How come not every expense is under accounts payable? Because some expenses are paid in cash. In fact, all these expenses were paid in cash, weren't they? Oh, no. The advertising wasn't paid up front in cash. So because we paid it later, it was an account pay-up bill. Some expenses are paid in cash. These expenses here were paid in cash, weren't they? This 600, 900, 200, the question said they paid it in cash, right? So if you pay it in cash, you don't have a bill. When I first paid this fertilizer guy, I paid him $7 cash, didn't I? Stop all that. When I first paid the fertilizer guy, did I pay him cash? The first time I paid them. So I didn't have a liability, remember? I didn't show a liability that first year. It was zero, wasn't it? Because I paid them cash. If you're going to pay them later, then you have an account pay a bill. Right? Account pay a bill. I'm saying it funny like that on purpose because what? Account pay a bill is a liability, right? Okay. Question. This is some money that you can make as an accountant. This thing is not adjusted for the Bay Area. Okay. I mean, chief financial officer between 183 and 384. If you told the chief financial officer of Apple he was going to make 384, he would weep openly. Okay. <laughs> public accounting firm, large firm, and they start talking about, you know, where's the larger amounts on here? I think the highest one's 86. That's nonsense. <laughs> okay. That's in the 90s. Right? And not the Bay Area. Okay. I have a friend who is a partner at a CPA firm. His job, he retired now, his job was to calculate the taxes for high wealth individuals. If you told him he was making $86,000 a year, he, you, he would say, I'm done. Just take me away. I don't want to be here anymore. It's more like half a million. Okay. Okay. All right. Might as well. Let's do it. Let's go ahead and do the quiz. This is the quiz for this particular set of slides. I put the, for this particular quiz, I put it in the slides. So this is the same thing as the quiz. This is the same file as the Word file that's labeled quiz on iLearn. I just stuck the questions in here. Okay, let's do it. Might as well get this chapter one out of the way. Okay, all right. So which of the following is not an external user of accounting information? Well, are regulatory agencies like the SEC external? Yes, they are. Are customers external? Yes, they are. When you're at Nordstrom and you're buying something and the phone starts ringing, you don't jump behind there and say, can I help you? This is Nordstrom. You know that you're external, right? Customers are external, okay? <laughs> if you do that, <laughs> stop doing that, okay? All right, investors are what? They're one of our primary external users, aren't they? 
investors and creditors. Okay, so all of these are external users. Which of the following is a primary user? Investors and creditors are our primary users, right? Although SEC and IRS are external uh, users, they are not what? They're not primary users. Investors and creditors are primary users. Okay. In order to increase comparability in recent years, the FASB and the ISB have made efforts to reduce the differences between U.S. GAAP and IFRS through a process called convergence. Now, a couple things. I didn't talk about this on the slides, and I will not put a question on the exam that I haven't prepped you for. But if you're taking an exam and something like this pops up and you're like, did we talk about this? Just use your understanding of the English language. When things converge, they come together, don't they? So if they're trying to join the two set of standards, it's a process that would probably be called what? Convergence. Okay, now let me explain to you what's going on here. There was a time, and by the way, this is an in-quiz teaching moment. Therefore, it could be relevant to your exam, right? In quiz, so if I teach you either up from the slides or in the quiz, I expect you to know that for your exam, okay? All right, so what happens? We're sitting here and we have US GAAP, we have IFRS. And for a long time, everybody said, it's not a question of if, but when the United States will change over to IFRS. And I used to sit there kind of muttering to myself thinking, I guess we were out drinking because I'm doing this. I'm thinking to myself, you know, um, that's not how things work in the United States. The SEC that's in the executive branch doesn't have the right to tell everybody, you will do this. Because if the companies don't like what the SEC is telling them to do, they do have an option, which is to do what? Exactly. Go to Congress and they'll say, if you require all of the companies to change the IFRS, the terrorists have won. They'll say whatever, okay, and I'm not trying to make light of terrorists. I'm just saying that they don't care what they say in order to uh, to get what they want, right? And so then Congress people will stand up and say, we shouldn't go over to IFRS because if we do, the terrorists have won. And then pretty soon, the echo chamber of the dysfunctional political system that we have has everyone going around, IFRS, terrorists, they're one and the same. So they did that, and the United States never went over to IFRS because they said enough bad things about it so that everybody said don't do it. Okay. Now, why would companies not want to go over to IFRS? What would be the reason a U.S. company would not want to change from U.S. GAAP to IFRS? Okay. Um, it turns out that IFRS probably increases net incomes, and the reason it does is because, remember, they let them write their assets up a little higher, so that piece of land that we bought way back in 1974 that we've been valuing at 100000 IFRS will let me value it at a million now. Bam! Instant earnings. Oh, taxes? Huh? You have to pay a lot more taxes. Well, taxes are an issue, okay, in that... Um, I may not have to pay taxes per the tax law on that particular situation because I haven't sold the property yet. And the tax laws are such that if you don't have the wherewithal to pay the tax, they don't make you have to pay the tax okay, until you actually sell the item. So that particular transaction wouldn't. But there are certain inventory methods that IFRS does not allow, that US GAAP does, that allow you to report a lower net income for your tax purposes under uh, under gap purposes that you wouldn't be available to use for IFRS and so you would have to pay more tax and that was a biggie okay not for the reason for that first transaction but for these inventory reasons that was a big reason what would be the other reason well they probably don't mind being compared because now they can attract what capital from other parts of the world and the comparison is easier right the main thing was that they don't want to pay the cost of converting all their systems that are all wired to U.S. GAAP. Now they got to rewire them to what? IFRS. So they never changed over. The U.S. never changed over to IFRS. So what happened is FASB and the International Accounting Standards Board got together and said, 
it, where can we find common ground? Where can we get the standards to agree? And let's work on doing that. So they're sort of like one of those couples that you hear about. Hey, did you hear they're back together? Oh, great. Oh, they broke up again. Oh, oh now they're back together. So it depends on what? On what the issue is at a point in time. And that process of trying to squeeze the two sets of standards together is called convergence. Okay. Okay, good. Liabilities of a company would Yes, sir. Uh, International Accounting Standards Board. The International Accounting Standards Board promulgates International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. The Financial Accounting Standards Board, which is what we're really learning in this class, will uh, promulgate generally accepted accounting principles. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Liabilities of a company would not include, is account pay a bill a liability? Yes. Account pay a bill? Is a note pay a bill a liability? Yes, yes it is. Is salary and wages pay a bill a liability? Right? That person's going to have to pay at some point. Is cash a liability? No. Cash is an asset, right? Future economic benefit. Yes. The origins of accounting are generally attributed to, I didn't cover this in the lecture, I won't ask you this on your uh, exam, but it might be interesting for you to know that the accounting methods that we're going to learn in this class have been around since the 12th century. They've been using the same methods that we will learn in this class since the 12th century to recognize business transactions, or at least the recording of it dates back to the 12th century. Okay, maybe it was being used even before then, but Luca Pacioli wrote in his journals, and he was a Catholic priest, so sometimes they call him the father of accounting. Meanwhile, he was not the father of accounting. He was writing in his journals about a lot of things that were going on in 12th century Venice, and one of the things he wrote about was this use of the accounting system that we're going to learn in this class. Okay, so a lot of times they attribute it to Luca Pacioli, Padre Pacioli. Now... More importantly, if something's been around since the 12th century, what does that tell you about it? It works. It's old, but it must work. If you don't believe me, look at the Roman numeral system. Okay, take 1,347,000 and divide it by 12 using the Roman numeral system. I'll wait. Oh, let's see, I carry the I, carry the V, carry the I, I, V. Now, the only reason we even know Roman numerals is because of the Super Bowl. Okay, well, I can handle the Super Bowl numbers, okay? So what happens? It was replaced by a system that what? Is much better to use the Arabic number system, right? And that's what we use now? Okay, and Roman numerals is reserved for things like the Super Bowl, okay? So if accounting is still around after all this time, it must work, right? The second thing it tells you is it must be easy. Think about it. Accounting is trying to reflect transactions that are happening that we created, right? We create these business transactions, and we're now trying to reflect them. So what happens? We have to come with a useful, easy system to do that. You don't come up with a complicated system to reflect something that you've created. Now you say, well, wait a minute, John, science is complicated. Yeah, because it has to be because we can't control what happens when wind blows on an airplane. When wind blows on an airplane, things happen if you don't make the vector equal the pull versus the thrust. I don't know, whatever the hell. Obviously, I don't know what I'm talking about. But you got to adhere to the rules so it can be as complex as it wants, can't it? Accounting, we created these transactions. We create an easy-to-use, effective system to reflect these transactions. So if something is easy, can you understand it? If people in the 12th century understood something, can you understand it? They thought that if you sailed too far, you fell into the mouth of monsters. Okay? So as we go through this system, you're going to see it's easy, it's effective. It's just that you have to put in the time to get used to it, and then it's easy. Okay? All right, good. Martin Corporation purchased land in 2007 for 290000 
in 2013, it purchased a nearly identical parcel of land for 460. In its balance sheet, Martin took the total value of these two and valued them at 920. So Martin did this. I bought this land for 290. And now I bought another piece of land for what? 460 that's identical. So I'm going to strike out 290 and I'm going to record both the old and the new at 460. That's how they came up with the 920. That's how they came up with the 920. They bought it for 290 and when they found an identical piece of land for 460, they scratched out the 290 and they put 460, didn't they? Tell me the total of 920. Is that where the 920 comes from? Is that what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to leave that first piece of land at its historical cost, right? So they violated the cost principle. They should have left it at 290, right? Okay. Okay, good. The private sector organization involved in developing accounting principles is the Financial Accounting Standards Board, the FASB, right? Okay. Question eight was so great, I put it twice. Cash is not a liability. I don't know why I put it a second time. Okay. Andre Dickinson, owner of Fine Wines, also owns a personal residence that costs 475000 the market value of the residence is 625. During the preparation of the financial statement for Andre's fine wines, the accounting cost set most relevant to his home is what? Economic entity assumption. He would not include his home in the financial reports of the business, right? We keep the activity of the owners separate from the activity of the business, right? The cost principle requires that when an assets are acquired, they be recorded at, they probably should have said fixed assets, because some assets we can put a fair value, right? But when they're acquired, um, they are recorded at cost, right? Report them at cost. The Deuce company has five plants nationwide that cost a total of one million. The current fair value of the plants is 500 million, the plants will be reported, recorded and reported as assets at what? Historical cost, 100 million. The economic entity assumption requires that the activities of the entity be kept separate from the activities of the owner. I mean, I think that's like right off the slide. A small neighborhood barbershop that is operated by its owner would likely be organized as a sole proprietorship. I don't know that uh, the barbershop is necessarily the best uh, way thing to look at here. It's more what? The business is operated by the owners. That tends to be a sole proprietorship. Although it could still be a corporation. Owners could, people that own the stock could also operate the business, right? Supercuts what? Okay. I don't know. I haven't been to Supercuts in a long time. <laughs> somebody said, when I first started shaving my head, somebody said, when did you shave your head? This morning. Okay. All right. So. I'm a bookkeeper. I have a small restaurant, a diner, and it's a corporation, but the owner owns the restaurant. Yeah, so that's why I'm saying this is not the best example because a, a barber shop, a small restaurant could incorporate and still be involved in the day-to-day -day operations, right? So, again, um, there's probably a better way to phrase this. This is probably not the best question. So, I mean, even in that example, I mean, wouldn't it make more sense to, like, to like not take on liability? Or like the, uh, I mean, like, isn't the point of being a corporation that you don't have to accept the liability for, uh... It limits your liability to whatever the investment in the business is. Yes, that's the point. Um, there are other things other than just bills that you may be trying to protect yourself from. For example, if there's some sort of accident, 
you know, somebody falls down and injures himself in the restaurant, they would sue the restaurant. They can't generally pierce the corporate veil and go through to the individual as well. So there's a lot of other reasons too. Yeah. So if you're have a, you've incorporated, you know, and you say, okay, now I'm going to start driving drunk and run this business to the ground because it's a corporate and they can't come after me anymore. We are still destroying. You know, at least when you start out, at least you had twenty dollars of lemons. Now you've gone and you've generate all these bills. They're going to take the lemons from the corporation. Now you're sitting there with nothing. Your house with no lemons anymore, right? So. Okay. Owner's equity is best described. Well, we know that owner's equity is what? Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. And so, like gentleman up here asked, doesn't that mean then that assets minus liabilities will equal stockholders' equity? It's what's left over. So if I have what? Cash of 100, cell phone bill of 40, my stockholders' equity is 60, isn't it? Liabilities are future economic benefit. That's an asset. Are existing debts and obligations? Yes. Sounds right. It's my bills, isn't it? Are your bills your debts and obligations? Okay. Pose service potential. That's a description of an asset again, isn't it? Equipment has service potential. Equipment is an asset, right? Are things of value used in the business operation? Again, another description of an asset, right? Something that has future economic benefit. Okay, good. Number 16, the accounting equation for Quattro Pro Enterprises is as follows. They have 120 of assets, 60 of liabilities, 60 of stockholders' equity. They purchase office equipment on account. When we use the phrase on account, guys, that means they have a bill. They're going to pay later. Hey, let me open up an account for you today. That means you're going to pay later, doesn't it? Okay, so when they get the equipment, are their assets going to go up? Yes. So, huh? Yes. I heard sounds of doubt out there. Okay, so that means that the assets will be what, 135? They got equipment. The liabilities are going to go from what? From 60 to 75? I have to add 15,000 there to the liabilities. I'm squeezing that in. So now that's 75,000. Did anything happen to my stockholder's equity? It stayed the same, so it's going to be 60,000 still, isn't it? Huh? That ties to choice D. This is that exercise that we went through just at the end of the slides, isn't it? A balance sheet shows what? Well, what balance is on a balance sheet? What balance is on a balance sheet? What balance is on a balance sheet? And don't say a rubber ball like on a seal's nose. What balance is on a balance sheet? Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. Therefore, the balance sheet must report assets, liabilities, and stockholders equity, right? The income statement reports what? Net income. Good. Income statement, net income. Net income is revenue minus expenses, isn't it? Okay. Let's look at this one. Misra, Misra, Misra. Company, com huh? Misra. Company compiled the following financial information on December 31st, 2013. Misra's assets at December 31st, 2013 are, and so um, is revenue an asset? No, it's revenue. Are retained earnings an asset? No, it's stockholders' equity. Is equipment an asset? Yes, it is. So we'll pick out that equipment, 40000 Are expenses an asset? No, they are expenses. 
Sometimes, guys, it sounds like I'm being a you-know-what. Someone will say, well, why isn't revenue an asset? Because it's revenue. And you're going to go, could you hear how rude he was? He, he didn't answer my question. Yes, I did. And sometimes that is simply the answer. It's not an asset. It is revenue. What do you want me to do? Go on a time machine and beat up Paceoli? Okay. All right. Okay. Expenses are not assets. Okay. Cash is what? An asset. Beautiful. Are dividends assets? No, they're dividends. Okay. Are supplies an asset? Yes, they are. Good. Excellent, guys. Is account payable an asset? It's a liability. Is account receivable an asset? Yeah, I'm going to be getting some money pretty soon. Is common stock an asset? No, it's stockholder's equity, right? So the answer is 125? Beautiful. I'm sure you're all verifying that with your calculators right now. Okay. All right. Now, this question, there's a typo. Stockholder's equity at December 31st, and it should have said December 31st, 2013. So if you looked at this and you were losing your mind or something, that's because it's a typo there. That's supposed to be 2013. So they want, what is a stockholder's equity? Now, stockholder's equity is made up of what? Common stock and retained earnings. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholder's equity. Therefore, liability is not stockholder's equity, right? It's its own category. Okay. So we know to answer this question, Common stock of 40,000 has to be part of the equation, doesn't it? What's the other part of, if this is common stock, what's the other part of stockholders' equity? Retain earnings, and they're going to make me figure this out, aren't they? They're going to make me figure this out? So retain earnings is like what? It's like the piggy bank. Eh, that piggy bank's body isn't big enough to do what I need to do with it. Okay. It doesn't have to have legs, but let's go ahead and give him some legs. Okay, so stop, John. Okay, so beginning, my mom was a good artist. I obviously am not, so I inherited the desire, but none of the ability. So the beginning balance at December 31st, 2013, uh, the beginning balance for the period is, is January 1st the beginning of the year? Is 1231 the end of the year? So the beginning balance is the 1113 balance, isn't it? So we started out with what, 30,000? Then we have to add what? We add net income to our piggy bank, don't we? And so what I do, guys, is I just go off to the side and I make myself up a little income statement. Little income statement. IS is income statement. So my revenues are how much? 170, good. My expenses are how much? 125, good, are my expenses. So revenue minus expenses is net income, isn't it? So I take the 170 minus the 125, that gives me net income of, huh? Good, 45,000. Okay, I'm saying good because you got it quickly. You should have used your calculator. Okay, 45,000 is my net income, right? And then I go ahead and I take money out of the piggy bank, don't I? When I take money out, I subtract what? I subtract my dividend. And my dividend was what, 10000 So I subtract 10000 So now the question wanted the ending balance, didn't it? This ending balance wanted the balance at the end of the year, 1231 13. That's why we had to fix the number. That's why I had to fix that typo. 1231.13 gives me an ending balance of what? How much? 65,000. I take that 65,000 and I do what? I have to add my common stock. That gives me a total stockholder's equity because my stockholder's equity is my common stock and my retained earnings of what, 105? Yes. So the answer here is what, C? Now, a way to look at how to calculate retained earnings is beginning balance, 
add net income, subtract dividends, gives me ending balance. BASE spells what? Okay, I know it's getting late now. BASE spells what? Base, beginning balance, add the net income, subtract the dividend, gives me the ending balance. Yes, sir. Well, for beginning balance, that's 30000 not 301000 right? Yeah. Sorry. I was subtracting for a second. Oh, no, yeah, that's, sorry. That's a, that's a comma. Sometimes I forget to do the little hoop on my commas. 30000 Okay. All right, guys. This is all on, on iLearn. Okay, you can take a picture if you want. It's all on iLearn. And I will be posting this lecture. So I'm going to go ahead and put this lecture up under Chapter 1. Okay. So the live stream, I don't even know if you can hear the audio. So I wouldn't worry about the live stream. I'd worry about the video that I will post under Chapter 1 slides. Okay.